other uh, elements of please go ahead of uh, due diligence for several years. We have the pleasure of having uh, MEP Lara Walters, who is the rapporteur of the file in the Parliament, in the European Parliament, and uh, and the Legal Affairs Committee, and uh, as well as uh, MEP Samira Rafaela, who has been the rapporteur in the Employment Committee. We have also Susana Ruiz from Guatemala, from La Pastoral de San Marcos. And online, we have the pleasure of uh, having uh, MEP Barry Andrews and uh, Anosha Wahidi from the Department for the Ministry of Development in Germany. So thank you very much, everyone, for being with us today. Uh, this is going to be an interactive discussion. The idea is to have a little bit of an exchange uh, about your experiences and views. And the focus of the event today will be in particular value chains and corporate uh, liability and access to justice. And what are the impacts and barriers that women face uh, in global value chains? What are the elements that the CSDD could bring in order to change that reality? So what are the opportunities that we also have? Um, with that, I'm going to start with the first uh, part of our panel, uh, which will be about the impacts and what are the implications in terms of the value chain coverage. And with that, I'm going to start with Carolina. Um, what are the gender impacts of corporate activities that you have uh, found in the value chains uh, of the communities you work with and where are these often found? Uh, well, thank you very much, Silvia, for the question, and thank you so much for the invitation. We're delighted to be here with the panelists, with the MPs and my colleagues from South America. As Silvia mentioned, uh, we work in an anti-trafficking, anti-forced labor organization, and uh, we focus on research and representation of victims. Uh, and I would like to, to discuss as an example two particular economic sectors, agriculture on the one side and fishing and particularly the salmon industry on the other hand. Uh, women right now in the world, we have, of course, we have uh, been able to fight for our rights and we are definitely in a better situation than probably 100 years ago, but we are still in a subordinated role and you can see how that replicates in abuses from companies. That particular condition stays with, you know, with the woman all along his, her life. And, and we can see it as well in what takes place in, in producing countries such as ours. So uh, Chile, as you might know, is an exporting country of raw materials and raw products. And therefore the lowest tiers are located in the country. What women experience basically is not only the the different elements of forced labor, we can, I mean, in the cases that we have uh, in uh, Chilean uh, courts, we are talking about all ILO indicators. We're talking about the non-payment of wages, social benefits, isolation, discrimination, um, uh, threats of dismissal. But of course, in the case of women, the situation is even uh, more complex because as we're talking about the, the lowest tiers of the supply chain that employ uneducated women from rural locations or migrant women, all these different uh, dimensions of forced labor have a much bigger impact because we're talking about women that have a family behind them. We're talking of women that are uh, the main source of income. So if you pay uh, wages below the minimum wage or not living wages, you're not only affecting the woman, but you're affecting her kids and the, the whole, uh, uh, the, the, her whole uh, family uh, network. On, on the other side, uh, the woman, women are much more exposed to uh, harm because because of the sexual dimension of being a woman, right? So what we are seeing is, of course, sexual harassment, something that uh, women, and particularly migrant women and rural women, are, are not um, denouncing, they're not complaining about it, they're not saying anything. And uh, also what we are seeing is a lot of impact regarding their maternity rights. Uh, so, for example, in, uh, in salon industry, what we are seeing is basically the, the imbalance of power, which is the basic context that it's underpinning the whole situation. Uh, what we're seeing is that uh, women workers, they are obliged to bargain regarding their maternity, their maternity rights. 
And also we're talking about sectors that are relying and and, and this is something that we continuously put red alerts on subcontracting regimes. And subcontracting regimes are basically legal authorizations of abuse. Um, and of course, when in considering the imbalance of power, maternity rights, maternity leave, uh, we cannot say that this woman, rural woman from local distance uh, regions, particularly in the case of Salmon in the South, Patagonia, there is no chance they could actually, you know, a counter uh, uh, argument the the what the the company is basically demanding. So if it's already hard for workers in producing countries, um, because also the whole system has naturalized inferiority and superiority among sexes, uh, if it's already hard for workers it's much harder for women workers. Oh, I don't know if it's, I'm okay with time. Thank you very much. That was very um, enlightening indeed and on time. Um, before going to the two MEPs who have put a lot more of the meats into the CSDD in order to make it gender responsiveness, I would like to hear also from Susana in your experience in Guatemala about the impacts uh, on women in agricultural value chains. In particular, you have uh, worked on the on pine oil uh, exports to the EU. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience there? Susana, thank you. Bueno, buenas tardes. Soy Susana López, indígena, Mayamam, defensora de derechos humanos y del medio ambiente. Voy a hablar del caso específico de dos empresas agroindustriales de palma y banano en la costa sur del occidente de Guatemala. Los monocultivos se instalaron sin consulta previa a la población. Uh, my name is Susana López. I am a man Mayan indigenous women right defender and uh, environmental defender. I'm gonna talk specifically about the case of agro, agro industries of palm and banana in the southwestern coast of Guatemala. Uh, monocultures were installed uh, without previous consultation of the population. Estas, eh, esta producción se instaló, como ya mencionaba, previa, eh, sin hacer consulta a la población y su forma de productor viene con impactos negativos para el medio ambiente. Las comunidades y específicamente la vida de las mujeres, la producción de palma y banano requieren grandes cantidades de agua e implican el uso continuo de agrotóxicos, mano barato de las mujeres que trabajamos en las empacadoras. So monocultures are, uh, are came to the communities without previous consultation and with a specific, uh, without evaluation of the uh, assessment, uh, with an impact assessment of the negative consequences for the environment and, and the communities, specifically for the life of women. The production of palm and banana requires great deal, great amount of water and the continuous use of agrotoxics. And they are also employing uh, women in the uh, packaging machines without minimum wage. Las empresas acaparan nuestra agua, nuestra tierra y la contaminan. Provocan sequía en la época de verano e inundaciones en época de invierno. Uh, corporations take our land, our water, and they pollute it. They provoke uh, droughts during summer and floods during winter. Además, las aspersiones aéreas con plagicidas supuestamente tienen un horario establecido, pero en realidad se da a cualquier hora, también cuando las mujeres caminan al molino para moler su maíz, para preparar las tortillas. The aerial uh, aspersion with plaguicides uh, is supposed to be happening in a specific schedule, but actually they are taking, uh, they are happening at any time. 
uh, also when women are walking towards the mill to grind their uh, corn for preparing their tortillas. Desde que las empresas hicieron obras en los ríos, tenemos problemas con el agua. Y hay solo una cosecha al año de maíz en vez de dos o tres. Since the corporations started uh, doing works around the rivers, they have issues with water and they have only one crop per year instead of two or three of corn. Las mujeres son las que alimentan a la familia. Las primeras que sufren cuando no hay agua, alimento, y cuando el agua está contaminada. Uh, women are the ones feeding their families. They are the first to suffer when there is no water or food and especially when the water is polluted. Ellas tienen contacto directo con el agua porque ellas lavan la ropa y los platos. Cuando no hay agua, tienen que eh, acompañar, tienen que caminar mucho para preparar los alimentos y eso afecta su tiempo y su economía. They are in contact with, uh, directly in contact with water because they are the ones uh, washing clothes and the dishes. When there is no water, they go, they have to fetch it uh, to prepare the, the food and that affects uh, their time and their economy. Y cuando en Guatemala, una mujer defiende sus derechos, es criminalizada, encarcelada o tiene que huirse del país. When in Guatemala, uh, a woman defends her, defends her rights, she's criminalized in prison or she has to flee the country. Cuando ustedes en Europa impo importan productos como la palma o el banano, debe considerarse los impactos en toda la cadena de valor y en particular en la vida de las mujeres que viven cerca de las plantaciones y que trabajan dentro de las plantaciones. When you in Europe import certain products like palm or banana, you have to consider the impacts in the full value chain, in particularly to life of women that are living in around those plantations and working around those, in those plantations. Muchísimas gracias, Susan. Thank you, Daniel, as well. Um, so we have heard these very impactful uh, testimonies from Carolina and Susana at the moment, who talked about the importance of living wages and how uh, corporate activities reinforce the gender dynamics and the power imbalances exist in the ground. Um, so when we talk about due diligence, we cannot assume that due diligence will already immediately address these dynamics that are not uh, addressed if it's not purposefully done. So what is gender due diligence and what do you think, Samira, that um, the CSDD needs to ensure uh, that there is a real change for women in global value changes? Yes, thank you very much. Um, well, it already starts off with very, I would say, concrete uh, presentations and indications of the specific issue that we would like to address through new legislation to make it more gender responsive and responsible for, for women as entrepreneurs, as consumers, but also as citizens with fundamental rights, fundamental rights. You mentioned uh, Chile and the rapporteur on Chile, the trade agreement. And I'm very proud uh, to see that we will have uh, the first time EU agreement in which we have incorporated a dedicated gender and trade chapter. And that's exactly for raising the issues that you have presented so well. Thank you for that. Um, and through that gender and trade chapter in trade agreements, we want to strengthen the economic position of women as consumers, but also as entrepreneurs. Um, we have incorporated, of course, also ILO conventions, also in line with the uh, ILO Convention 169 when it comes to the fundamental rights of indigenous people. And um, we hope that through having these gender and trade chapters, um, we can make sure that women also economically um, um, benefit more from trade agreements, because this is what we in general see, uh, that they are part of marginalized communities. They are vulnerable uh, communities uh, that either don't sit at the table, that uh, do not decide, uh, they don't engage, 
um, and their questions are not being raised with women, but also with girls about um, how economic policies or trade policies are going to affect their businesses. And in this gender and trade chapter, for example, we even go that far that we are um, that we are making sure that they that we transfer knowledge and digital skills also uh, for women, for example, to to make use of e-commerce um, as an instrument to strengthen their businesses. So that's on on the trade side, and that's I think very closely linked to new legislation as due diligence. As the rapporteur in the EMPO uh, committee, my first priority was to make uh, at least my report gender uh, responsive, because what we can see throughout the value chain is that women play a very crucial role in certain industries and sectors. Take, for example, the textile industry, but also the hospitality and tourism sector that is being part of the scope that I have created in my report. Uh, because we have looked in the first place at the sectors where we see that a lot of women work, where they are very vulnerable to having uh, a, a low income, um, sexual harassment uh, when it comes to the labor conditions. And uh, this is how we decided to broaden the scope, for example, with tourism, but uh, definitely with the textile industry. But we even incorporated uh, the financial sector, the finance sector. Because also there, when it comes to the access to finance, finance, who gets money, who gets the access, then we see that women mainly do not benefit from it very well. So um, what we also did um, in the report is to make sure that they are part of meaningful engagement. So the one of the main issues that we uh, that we could analyze when it comes to due diligence is that they are not part of meaningful engagement as being stakeholders. So they don't have the access to the tables. Um, we also need to make sure that they play a crucial role when it comes to, for example, determining the uh, adverse impacts, um, when it comes to, for example, prevention. And these are all kinds of you know, elements where we don't see women engaged. So. We made sure that we have a gender responsive approach throughout the value chain. And basically the theory and formula behind that is that every single step we make in this value chain, we need to ask ourselves, how does this impact women? Because what we also see in practice is that women and the specific economic and social situation of women are not you know, engage the perspectives are not even incorporated in the new policies that we make. So that can be an organizational policy, um, that can be, for example, a, a business strategy, it can even be a business model where we see that there is a lack of, uh, of gender perspectives. Well, and this is exactly what we um, have trying to, uh, that we have been trying to, you know, arrange through the, the report, um, and I'm very happy, very proud that we voted in favor of that last week. Um, and when it comes to the access to complaints procedures and social justice in relation to due diligence, uh, we will come to that later, but that's, uh, that, that's also a very crucial topic that we have analyzed uh, throughout the value chain, yeah. Thank you very much, Samida. Um, with that, we do have an introduction into the second section uh, about uh, barriers for access to justice. But before we move into that part and we hear from you, Lara, I would like to uh, ask a couple of more questions on this first topic of the value chains to our speakers online. Uh, MEP Barry Andrews and Ms. Anusha Wahidi from the Ministry of Development. Can you hear us well? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Welcome and, and thank you very much for joining us online. Um, Barry, maybe I'll start with you, if I may. Uh, Caroline and Susana spoke about the adverse impacts and uh, uh, Samira was ex shedding some light on some of the elements that are necessary to improve in the CSDD and that have been already introduced in the employment uh, report and as well as uh, in the jury report by Lara Walters at the end of last year that it's still under negotiation, but that already 
puts in uh, the similar elements about gender responsiveness. However, we know that the topic of value chain, in particular, the coverage of upstream and downstream has been a very controversial uh, point of discussion uh, in the parliament, as it was also in the council and in the commission, not fully covered um, as we would have liked. So um, why do you think there is opposition to the inclusion of the full value chain and how could we overcome this opposition in light of uh, the impacts that women face in global value chains? Thank you. Well, thank you uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's great to join this, this panel and this discussion, which has already been very illuminating for me um, uh, with the examples the examples that Susanna and Carolina gave were in relation to upstream harms and really described quite well uh, the vulnerabilities uh, and the requirement for a gender uh, lens on how due diligence is carried out. Um, as far as the question is concerned, why is there opposition to in the inclusion of downstream uh, human rights risks in the uh, legislation? I think there's a general uh, opposition from certain member states and some political groups uh, to broadening the scope and broadening it to the full value chain. Uh, there's a perception out there that this is Brussels bureaucracy gone mad that we are putting too great a pressure on businesses during a time of uh, serious economic uh, turmoil. And so that's the difficult context in which we have to have these conversations. But I think that there is a, a beginning to emerge a much more strategic approach to this question among those who wish to see the full value chain uh, included in the directive. Uh, I think that we can see uh, some of the NGOs and some of the business groups beginning to make a case for the inclusion of downstream uh, value chain, the full value chain into the scope of the, of the directive. And I think that would be really, really positive because, um, and, and in my own committee, in the trade committee, uh, we uh, settled on uh, an amendment in our report which includes uh, the downstream uh, part of the value chain, but excludes the use of the goods. Um, and that was a compromise that was necessary uh, to make sure that we had a majority at all in my committee. And in the end, we had a majority of just three votes. So it was crucial to get it over the line, uh, but it does include downstream services. And many of the business groups uh, have identified uh, technology companies as being really important here, uh, including downstream consequences, so that um, adverse effects associated with marketing, with advertising, and e even with the disposal of uh, goods is also uh, contemplated in the, in the directive. And, you know, clearly this is uh, something that we're going to have to uh, work on in the next while. I think we have to be much more strategic about how we approach this by bringing together the case studies like we've heard from Carolina and Susanna, uh, like we saw in an excellent study published by the Danish Institute for Human Rights last month, which made, uh, uh, which, which um, gave the examples of six major companies uh, that are already carrying out downstream due diligence without a proper regulatory framework, but nevertheless, they're doing it because they identify the actual commercial value of doing this well. So what we need to do is build up this coalition of the willing, essentially, uh, in order to, uh, to face head on the arguments that have been made. Uh, and I hope uh, that answers your question. Thank you very much also for um, your perspective on looking for ways forward already. And it's important that we have these uh, elements uh, to work together in the next uh, stages. Um, to finalize with this first section, I would like to ask uh, Ms. Wahidi, um, touching upon the points that Carolina made about living income and also uh, what uh, Susanna was sharing about the impacts on the women who are the ones in charge of feeding their families and the impacts, for instance, on water or their health as well. Um, you have been uh, mentioning in previous occasions the importance of living wages in the feminist development policy of Germany. 
uh, or a living income rather. And uh, we would like to hear a little bit from you also um, on that other side that inspires living income and its uh, fair purchasing practices. And this is also some of the one of the demands uh, that civil society has been making uh, in order to bring gender responsiveness into the directive. Why, in your opinion, is this uh, our fair, fair purchasing practices and living income crucial to ensure that due diligence laws are gender responsive? Yes, thank you very much. I hope you can hear and see me. Um, I think you raise an extremely important uh, issue on the question. Um, in, uh, as you know, by the beginning of this year, our Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act came into force. And, um, oh, I see, you can see me. Okay, I, I will try. Ah, I hope you now can see me. Thank you. Yeah? Okay, perfect. Um, as you might know, our um, Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act just came into force beginning of this year in Germany. And the core, the heart of our legislation is basically um, the fair uh, purchasing practices because we see purchasing practices and living income and living wages, both of them, as the main cause uh, of the global power imbalance. And I'm very happy to, to have heard this uh, issue a couple of times by the um, uh, previous panelists because this is actually the reason why we came up with our legislation. That's why my ministry, the Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development was in lead of that um, together with the Ministry of Labor and Economy uh, for this um, law, because we see the impact of our way of consumption in the global south. So what we have to do is we have to take responsibility in that regard in fair purchasing practices, um, and especially uh, living wages and income is one central part of it. And that should be also reflected in the CSDD. And because especially women are affected by that, and the, the previous panelists already mentioned some sectors where specifically women are ex extremely targeted in the value chain. So purchasing practices are, in our experience, unilaterally dictated by buyers um, from the uh, global north to suppliers in the global south. And um, they do not often reflect the realities and um, more often increase the already very precarious working conditions of women. And especially my ministry worked in the textile sector in the uh, past years, and we see that very, very often. So that's really something that could be a game changer if uh, especially buyers in the global north come up with strategies um, in their risk management tools on how to bring um, fair purchasing practices in the game. And um, these purchasing practices, they do not allow suppliers in the global South to be able to pay living wages. Not all of them, but most of them. And for the self-employed, it's not enough for the living wage. Um, so the situation of uh, many, many women um, in the global South will only change in our point of view. Um, if there is a decisive change in that uh, regard and uh, responsible purchasing practices, what does it actually mean? Um, we uh, mentioned that a couple of times it requires a level playing field between uh, buyers and suppliers. And um, especially um, that allows uh, suppliers to negotiate prices, lead times, fair payment terms. Uh, these are actually the criteria for us in order to, to see that reflected. And let me add one point. Um, in, regarding living wages. So if women are enabled to earn a living wage uh, or an uh, income, this will also make a decisive contribution to a positive change in the realities of their life. And I, I'm talking in broader terms like access to education, social security schemes and healthcare. They're often excluded from that due to um, the lack of adequate uh, wages. And you were already mentioning our um, feminist development and uh, policy, which was introduced by our minister and our minister of uh, um, exterior uh, last week, um, which solely um, tries to reflect that. How can we change the situation of women in the global south? And these two aspects have a pivotal role in that, of course. But we're not only talking about strengthening rights. We, we would like to see women more visible um, uh, we, we would like to raise their vi visibility and their representation um, in politics, but also uh, on the on the ground when when we're working uh, when we're talking about uh, strengthening rights holders' rights. So a legal framework uh, that allows uh, um, responsible purchasing practices, and that should be included in the CSDD as well. Um, 
should be sort of, uh, in our point of view, it's a decisive uh, uh, piece of puzzle for the smart mix. We're always talking about the smart mix of measures. What was missing in the past years um, was exactly this legal, legally binding framework. And now that we have it in Germany, uh, we would love to see it in, in Europe as well. And uh, let me add one point, and I hope we will have time later on today to reflect on that as well, is um, a law as such alone won't change the structural problems on the ground. So we need accompanying measures, but not only for businesses to better understand their due diligence, but also and especially for civil society and trade unions in order to provide more information for people on the ground in the global south, especially for women and to foster access to, to remedy and uh, access to justice. So uh, I hope we will have time to reflect on that later because I think that's an important piece of puzzle as well. We shouldn't forget that a law alone um, is not like uh, the, the silver bullet. There is uh, way more to do. And uh, that, that sounds like music, music to my ears. Um, one more point on the on the living wages versus living income. I mean, there's a difference between living wages and living income. Um, unfortunately, I didn't manage in my report to get living income in it. I was very much in favor of it. But unfortunately, because of also, I think, a little bit of a still, I would say, traditional way of looking at the role of women, uh, only talking about living wages in, in relation to women, uh, is something that we also need to transform because we also need to speak about living income in relation to women. Take, for example, the agriculture sector in Africa, where we have a lot of female smallholder farmers. And then you speak about living income, for example. So what is very important is that next to the living wages, we also make sure that the women who have their own businesses who hold, for example, their own farms. Uh, have received an income uh, through which they can take care of their family and making sure that they can also invest in their own future. So for the end result of due diligence, it is very important to have the essence of living, living wages, but also the essence of living income for especially women and marginalized communities in it. Um, this is why I very much like to work also on trade and gender equality, because in that aspect, we can uh, speak more about living income. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very important difference that, that we need to uh, be sharp on, and we need to put more emphasis and focus, too, on living income for women. Thank you very much for those precisions. And uh, actually, that also makes me think of uh, the garment sector, where home-based workers also are often not even part of the mapping of the value chains. And this reminds us of the importance of a transparency in the mapping and the full coverage again of the value chain uh, in all sectors and uh, how insufficient it was already the, the list of sectors that the council, the commission proposed. And it's very appreciated that in both your reports, there is an attempt to increase uh, that list of high risk sectors. Um, maybe as some, um, as a way of uh, introducing the second part of the conversation, I would like to maybe just summarize very briefly a couple of the points mentioned until this moment. And uh, we heard from Susana and from Carolina the importance of the type of impacts that we see both in upstream uh, value chains, such as the agricultural value chain of uh, palm oil, but also the downstream and the financial sectors, as uh, Carolina mentioned as well, and the importance of having a full transparency and coverage of those value chains, but also from Samira and uh, Barry, the importance the, of, of having um, other elements such as uh, full stakeholder engagement uh, in, in, as part of the duty that covers, that ensures that women are taken into consideration at every step of the way that they're active, uh, informing, actively informing uh, the decisions that are made and that are going to affect their lives when it comes to corporate uh, operations. Um, and we heard also the importance of having uh, complementary measures uh, such as in trade agreements or accompanying measures that we're going to go into 
as well uh, as we go deeper into the part of enforcement um, and therein also the importance of the uh, purchasing practices to ensure that there is a living income and that those small companies down the value chain um, have enough resources also to implement the due diligence measures that bigger companies subject to the CSDD are going to be required to comply with. So it's an ele important element also to make possible this uh, full value chain coverage indeed. Um, and as uh, Ms. Wahidi was mentioning, we don't do anything with having a beautiful law that covers the full value chain and it's, uh, it has a perfect duty without the enforcement. And that's uh, the second point we would like to discuss uh, today the enforcement uh, mechanisms and the barriers that uh, women face to access justice when harm has not been prevented, when harm already occurred. Um, and uh, for that, I would like to start uh, again with you, Carolina, uh, about some of the barriers that you have faced or the women that you work with have faced when trying to access justice um, in cases of corporate abuse. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, if I'm not mistaken, very recently, uh, I think it was the British Institute of International and Comparative Law, or maybe the Human Trafficking Legal Center, I'm not so sure, they just launched uh, a report on what happens when trafficking victims have uh, access to legal representation, and things change completely. And that is exactly what we don't have in our producing countries. So regarding uh, barriers uh, to access justice, the 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 system in place is all it's it's already made uh, against the weaker the weaker part. Um, so if if there is um, no free legal access in a country, it's going to be very very difficult for a worker to be able to pursue the responsibility of the company. And I'm going to link it with something that was said in 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 the former discussion uh, regarding downstream. Uh, the, the, the downstream side of the supply chain, what we've seen uh, in our cases, agricultural cases, is that uh, usually uh, subcontracting companies have to be registered in official registries of labor, Ministry of Labor Inspection. These companies, not only they don't register, but all of them have bank accounts and they, they were able to have bank accounts with no one in the bank asking for that particular registry. So regarding as, access to justice, it's, it's also another argument, an important argument to include uh, upstream and downstream supply chain, because we're seeing that financial institutions have a huge responsibility on concealing these kinds of situations that by the way, they're already incorporated in the anti-money laundering regime. So it's interesting how there is an, a, a, an a certain equivalence between the downstream supply chain and the existing uh, money laundering regime. Um, and, and so therefore you can see that there are little, there are mechanisms all around the behavior of companies uh, where we can see that there are obstacles to go after their responsibility. And that is why any, um, not, not only the access to lawyers, but also our, our victims, our representatives are, they also uh, suffer and experience the discrimination itself. As I mentioned before, this naturalization of the inferiority of women, it's of course present in judges, in prosecutors, in labor inspectors, and even the, the police. So therefore any, um, the existence of mandatory legal mechanisms uh, that that a worker can access are crucial to once again counter uh, attack the power imbalance. We always have to think that what we're dealing here basically has to do with this with recovering this equilibrium, and and we always say in 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 Chile it's it's quite interesting how. Right now, the conversation regarding the, the responsibility of companies all around the world, it's, it's incredible how it is basically a, a conversation about how do we protect sustainability of life. And we can connect that with what Susanna was saying. It's not only the labor dimension 
that it's incredibly harmed in the workers in our producing countries. It's basically the whole sustainability of, of, of life because there is a huge connection and we can see it in the cases itself. And we believe that it also has to do with certain level of, of I mean, of the basic values our societies uh, are stand on uh, that has uh, that you can see in this connection between environmental damage and uh, violation of, of labor rights and, and, and women rights. So uh, we believe it's it's crucial in order to uh, counterbalance this this impulse to death, because if, if we don't stop this, everyone's going <laughs> to die, right? The whole planet. If we don't uh, have if we don't put different mechanisms that create, you know, formal venues for workers uh, to be able to claim, to present their cases, we're, we're not gonna attack the, the basic obstacle, which is this, this power imbalance. Thank you very much, Carolina. Um, with that in mind, Lara, and knowing the key role that you have been playing at the European Parliament, um, also in putting forward in, that there is uh, effective enforcement mechanism both in terms of administrative and civil enforcement. Um, could you share with us a little bit of what are your proposals to ensure that barriers to access justice for women are addressed in the directive? Yes, of course, with, with pleasure. Um, and thank you for organizing. Thank you for bringing us together. And one of the beautiful things about this directive is that you could spend a lifetime, I think, working on any of the the the, the aspects um, on this um, that we've so far singled out. I was in an event on on the tech industry and the particular problems to do with the tech industry and due diligence, which also has a gender angle. We're talking about gender now. There's there's such a vast array of 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 sectors and 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 topics that are linked to this that you sometimes feel um, that um, from now until the elections is not nearly enough time to to right all the wrongs that we're that we're faced with. But this is this is indeed a really important one. And maybe just as a general comment before I start, I think that good due diligence um, is in itself is by its very nature gender gender sensitive due diligence. Um, and what I mean with that is that if due diligence is done properly, then it's due diligence that zooms in and that looks at whatever particular interests are at stake um, in the particular sector or area that, that a company is, is working with. Um, and what that means is that it might be women, it might be other vulnerable stakeholders. And one of the issues that I've identified policy-wise or is that there's a certain tension in that because I think that we want to do the right thing as policymakers, and we know that there's an issue with gender, um, but I think that we need to be careful when we look at gender that we don't pull it out in such a way that it'll make companies think, okay, look, I've looked at gender, I've done that, you know, moving on. Because I think that whatever context a company is working in, it needs to, to, to think about what in that context the vulnerable stakeholders are. Um, and very often they will be women, um, but they might also be other minorities, etc. I spoke to a group of, um, of persons last week to, um, who uh, notified me of um, a lot of issues, environmental issues around uh, mining and modern mining in in Europe, um, and uh, in in the cases to do with with um, uh, with their to uh, with their situation, um, it'll be really important that local communities um, that have been you know on a on a certain land somewhere for centuries that that those are engaged with. So what I'm trying to say is that we need to make sure that we get it right in this directive. Um, but uh, I'm I'm always a little bit wary of okay if you pull out one thing then th what does that mean for for other vulnerable stakeholders? The other problem that I I see or the is the 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 structural problems or the structural discrimination um, that that is always linked with this, um, and it was mentioned by by other speakers. But um, we want companies to uh, to 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 be particularly mindful of of gender aspects. But what does that mean in countries where um, uh, maternity leave is, is non-existent, right? Where, where it just doesn't exist. And we go and tell companies, okay, but you need to be mindful of. Um, it's such a, a, an uphill battle in these kind of contexts because the, the structural situation that, that we're in is already so uh, up, up against us in a, in a way. Um, 
And the same with, we, we spoke of living income before child labor. Um, when you look into these issues, um, I want to make sure that um, we, we think through what we're asking here um, and that we always go a little bit further than um, in a sense, making ourselves good by putting the right claims on the table, which we absolutely need to do for companies, but without then having a type of adverse impact. Because when we talk about smallholders, for instance, I've had these conversations and um, I would love to say absolutely we need to tell our European companies to always be, be paying a, a living income. And I've also heard the stories of, okay, and what does that mean on the ground? Because there's a competition going on that, that might actually exclude the, the very persons that we want to be in work from work because of it. Um, and so not to be a downer on the conversations, but the, the truth, of course, in all of these topics is it is so vastly complex and it's it's our task to deal with that complexity. Um, but I don't, also don't want to, to, to diminish it. Um, in this directive itself, on you asked about access to, to justice. Um, I think what we need is we need good liability, sound liability mechanisms. That's something that's already fought um, by the largest group in the parliament who says we don't need a liability mechanism at all. But if we don't have teeth in this, then where do you go as a woman or as a particularly affected stakeholder when something has gone wrong? Um, but to do that, we need to make sure that there's very concrete things in this direct and for instance, on the reversal of the burden of proof, which won't be easy. I mean, uh, it's what we need, but it's going to be a huge fight on access to documents, very practical things on limitation uh, periods for bringing claims because it takes takes time to get organized, right? Um, on uh, state support and legal aid and limiting costs for, for claimants, for instance, um, and on organizations being able to bring claims on behalf of, of those seeking justice. So that I think is around liability. And then for the rest to come back to my earlier point on good due diligence is gender sensitive due diligence. It's making sure that on all these other points, we're, we're doing something that's sound. And that means proper consultation. It means fair purchasing practices, as was mentioned. And I, I worked on that a little bit in the, the, the lead up to my report. And it's, it's so important that we give companies almost like a blueprint of what that means and what it looks like. Um, and what it looks like is not saying, and now, uh, and now the problem is yours when you make a contract with a supplier, um, uh, etc. It means uh, uh, making sure that when we talk about the thresholds for what companies need to do this, that as was mentioned before, that franchises or subsidi subsidiaries, that those are also included. Um, so I, I heard about problems at McDonald's, for instance, sexual abuse. Um, then I hear, well, McDonald's has a very smart way of organizing itself in Europe, and it's such a, a franchise model that actually all of these individual entities, they won't make the threshold for actually having to do due diligence. So it's that, for instance, it's the whole value chain, as was said, it's uh, making sure that uh, informed consultation takes place. I talked to a, a group of women from Papua who said, you know, who gave me the classical example of um, a town hall meeting was called. We were made to sign our name in a register somewhere. Then we were told about plans for um, uh, essentially creating new palm oil plantations in our village. We signed our name thinking, yes, fine, we're here. And at the end of the day, that signature was used for consent for removing them from their from their lands. Um, I've given you a little bit of, of everything here, I think, and not only on liability, sorry. Can I just ask one question? Because, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Lara, because you triggered me you triggered me a bit on on your point on living income and and the smallholder farmers so basically basically what i would like to know is what exactly do you foresee there because so so why did you make the point like you just did on smallholder farmers and living income because during my conversations with for example the the, the smallholder farmers from the cacao industry uh, from Ghana, Côte d'Ivoire, uh, Togo. Uh, I've been to Ghana last year, and and they all said that if we would have a living income, then they are very sure that other kinds of issues, like for example, child labor, or you know other kinds of you know labor that we don't want, or other issues, uh, will be prevented. And the, the main essence they see is that there is a lack of living income. Um, and this is exactly why I make it so, you know, why I so prioritize this uh, based on the conversations that I had with the smallholder farmers. So, but, but can you elaborate a bit more on that? 
Um, I can, but it's not it's not the topic here. But um, my uh, my point is that we want to make sure that we we do the right thing, but without unintended consequences. And I'm I'm fully with you, and we share we share the goal of living income. Um, but one thing I notice sometimes in conversations on um, uh, uh, on with with conversation with people on the ground, and for instance, the agriculture sector, is that. Um, our wishes and the world over there. There's 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 a gap between them, and so on uh, on on living income. What I'm told is it's often paired with the wishes of companies that want to do better. Right. So we've got living income. We've got sustainability questions. We've got uh, questions on. Uh, companies saying we want to know more about where a certain product is coming from, how it was produced, who was involved in that. And what I've I've heard is that that basket of things that are then asked to local communities in a sense, that that makes some of them go, we cannot, um, we cannot meet those requirements in a sense, or why would we go and 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 work with companies who are who are asking these things when actually there's a there's a bunch of them that are that are easier to work with and it's uh, it's a difficulty of we 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 have this this goal um, but always thinking about okay so on the ground are we entirely sure that it gets us to where we need to go and it's it's the same type of issue with child labor where we're all completely convinced of we we have to make sure that child labor is eliminated and then when you speak to uh, to, to persons dealing in the cocoa sector again with child labor or to UNICEF, what they'll say is, yeah, if you if you say we need to have a zero tolerance policy on child labor, what might happen in practice on the ground is that entire families will be without an income, right? Because the children might be the only ones able to work if the, the, the family income disappears, but actually there's no education or alternative provided for the children. And so um, it's 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 just that the difficulty, I suppose, of policy making <laughs> to navigate our way our way through it, um, to keep having these conversations as as you and I are, um, and and to just make sure that at the end of the day we always well we always keep our eye on on the ball that we that we uh, that we achieve impact, which I'm sure you know all of us share as as the ultimate goal of of this directive. Thank you very much for the intervention and for the question. Mindful <laughs> mindful of the time, and I know that MEP Andrews needs to leave shortly. Um, I'm going to jump a little bit the, the queue and uh, give him the opportunity maybe to say some concluding remarks before he has to depart. And then we're gonna try to close the panel because I also understand you have limited time, but we have a couple of more interventions that we would like to, to ensure are heard before we finish. MEP Andrews, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still there. And uh, I'm really sorry I'm not there in physically because it's a fantastic discussion and uh, really it's enlightening. Um, you know, in the Trade Committee, access to justice issues uh, didn't arise in terms of our competences. But um, as, as a lawyer myself, uh, I'm really interested in uh, the issues that arise here. And uh, I think L Lara outlined you know, issues to do with access to documents and legal aid and all of those dimensions. Um, but but just <clears throat> could come back to the points I was making earlier on downstream, there, there are cases now being taken um, in relation to uh, human rights abuses downstream, and we're beginning to see the outline of them. And I happen to be working on a, a, an issue to do with surveillance technology. You'll all have heard of Pegasus spyware and predator spyware, and cases have been taken uh, because of the sale of this type of technology to uh, to Libyan government call, uh, resulting in torture. And that is a French case that's currently ongoing, but it's had some early success as far as the applicants are concerned. And what it does is, and your first speaker will talk about this much, much better than I will, but it opens up this uh, possibility for access to justice for downstream cases. So they're being listened to in member state courts right now and and that's really interesting uh and i think there, there are there are other cases that are um you know the one in the us around o the opioid em epidemic and the uh, the damage that was done and created a civil liability uh, through the irresponsible sale of um of certain drugs so i i think it's it's uh and i just want to conclude on one thing is in the trade committee uh, i think about a, more than a year ago we heard from the International Trade Center, 
uh, an individual by the name of Pamela Coke Hamilton, who leads that organization. And she briefed the Trade Committee on what she referred to as the unintended consequences of the due diligence directive. And she really brought our attention to being careful how we approach all of these issues and that we uh, we don't look at these issues in a binary way and that we're fully conscious of the, the complexity of uh, the types of um, initiatives, the types of amendments we put forward. So uh, I think that's worth looking back to what they have uh, advised us about uh, when we deal with all of these issues. So uh, thank you very much for allowing me to jump the queue and to my fellow panelists and to, to everybody that's present. Um, but I do have to catch a flight to Brussels. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. So can I quickly add something before Barry leaves? Uh, please, to, please do. Thank you, I would, uh, Barry, and also to Lara. Um, I think there is something already there um, in our uh, um, uh, 2020 German, uh, German presidency. There was a paper um, highlighted, and we very much uh, asked everyone to, to look at that when it comes to access to justice. It's from the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights, and they reflected a lot of points of what you already said, uh, Lara. And there was a consensus within the uh, member states on that. And in our, and I just looked it up in our German uh, conclusions, you will find. Uh, the passage which says to support and actively make use of the work of the FRA. So I would highly recommend to look at that because um, especially the point of burden of proof, representative action that um, um, Lara was already pointing at um, is very much debated in that paper. And uh, I think it's a very robust foundation to, to, to look at um, in, the, um, in the next coming uh, negotiations. Thank you very much, Ms. Wahidi. And maybe with that, I still keep you on, on the screen um, to finalize this point on access to justice. Uh, a couple of questions also for you, Samira, and for uh, Susana before we close. Unfortunately, we're not going to have time for questions anymore. And uh, also for a uh, forward-looking uh, question that was about how do we move forward in the trial of negotiation. So I guess that I will have to rain check that for the audience and ask uh, the, the panelists to maybe accompany us in an upcoming event to discuss that point. But for now, uh, with regards to barriers and to complement the picture that was presented, the complexities that were highlighted but by Lara and for um, not only like the, ne the necessary, the need to, to emphasize on the intersectional nature of due diligence that has to be context related, but because of those barriers in the ground, the impossibility of having that without explicitly mentioning the different groups in situations of, of, of vulnerability, including children and women. Um, that's the, it's the same situation in, when we're crafting the elements to access justice. Um, for, for you, Anusha, what is the perspective, from your perspective, what elements should be included in the CSDD to ensure better access to justice? And you mentioned accompanying measures uh, earlier today. Would you like to uh, elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, uh, thank you very much, um, Sylvia. Um, I think most of what I actually wanted to say was already said by Lara, and I'm very thankful that it's reflected already. Um, so in any case, the directive uh, must take into account um, the power imbalance that we were talking about today uh, quite frequently between the global north and the global south. And um, it's especially when it comes to uh, access to information. And I would like to highlight two points maybe out of this uh, um, FRA a report that I was um, already mentioning um, that we reflected in our German regulation. As you know, we don't have civil liability in the German regulation, but what we foresee is a representative action that NGOs and trade unions are eligible to, to take up the case for the, uh, for the rights holders. I think that's a very crucial point because we, what we see as a financial but also language uh, barrier uh, of the rights holders. I think that will be an um, important component to, to be uh, seen and reflected in the CSDD. And the other thing is what Lara already uh, mentioned. We have, a, we have the burden of proof. Um, and what we have in Germany, and th this is the second point that I would like to, to, to look upon, we are, of course we have public authorities and that's the 
that that's the enforcement that we foresee in our German regulation. And the public authority, of course, collects information. Um, what can be foreseen is that uh, the, the rights holders get access to that information of the public authority, which makes it uh, rather easier for them to collect these in, uh, this information. And on the other hand, um, what could be uh, what we could also think about is a rebuttable presumption that could be a good way forward. Um, uh, yeah, um, besides the uh, right to inspect files, um, then we don't have a complete uh, reversal of the burden of proof. I understand that it's sometimes uh, difficult to to arrange, but a rebuttable uh, presumption could be a way forward. Um, so these are the two things. In any case, whatever we do, also in the CSDD, we have to overcome somehow the this uh, global power imbalance. And uh, speaking of um, the smart mix, as we call it, uh, the voluntary measures, I think it's very important to, on the one hand, um, to have a smart mix of these measures, but also of actors. We should not only concentrate on businesses. It's very important to sort of address businesses and, and uh, explain them. Uh, what their due diligence is according to the CSDD and the legal framework and how they can uh, comply with their due diligence. But on the other hand, it's also important to support uh, civil society and uh, trade unions to especially foster access to justice. As we see in the Global South, it's not a normality. And I would like to um, point out two programs. We have various uh, uh, programs in Germany. And if you like, I, would, uh, I can also send you a fact sheet that you can share with the audience uh, uh, with um, multiple uh, measures that we are actually supporting. But two I would like to point out. Um, the first thing is uh, our help desk, help desk on business and human rights that we have in Germany since 2012 and we would like, uh, 17, sorry, um, uh, and we would like to scale that up on European level. That means a help desk that helps businesses to better understand due diligence and uh, how to comply with their due diligence. On the other hand, um, uh, our ministry, the BMZ, uh, has launched a Team Europe initiative together with the EU member states and the European Commission to improve the coordination uh, of support services for companies and um, yeah, uh, on EU level. And we um, also have uh, only in Germany, but uh, of course, businesses uh, from around the world can apply for that. We have an initiative called Global Solidarity with the ESG First Fund. So that means that small and medium sized businesses can apply from the Global South, can apply for funds uh, at our ministry um, yeah, to, to help them improve their sustainability management, because that will be definitely something that uh, they have to, to target in the future. Because what we would like to prevent is the cascading effect that the big businesses uh, you know, uh, just um, outsource their, um, their due diligence and um, make uh, things uh, more difficult for small and medium-sized enterprises in the Global South. And uh, um, that's something that we would like to see reflected in the um, Global Solidarity um, Program that we just recently, um, yeah, we started it uh, while Corona started, but it, it has definitely a focus on our due diligence legislation since a year. Thank you very much, Anusha. I'm mindful of the time and I know that Lara needs to leave right now. So thank you very much for accompanying us today. And we will definitely stay in touch to follow up on these points. Before we conclude, however, I would like to thank you very much. Um, give the floor one last time to Samira because you have been working also on the preventative aspects of the um, removing those barriers to access justice. Would you like to share a little bit more on that part of the preventing mechanisms? Yes, sure. So um, uh, obviously, you know, you need to you need to work throughout the whole value chain. That means like from step zero to the, the very last step. And uh, part of the very last steps is that um, we have, for example, complaint uh, mechanisms and procedures in place um, where where people can 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 do their complaint or they can. Uh, give a very important or serious sign that something is is wrong, and uh, based on the statistics, uh, the researches that we could find, uh, is that again we can see that when it comes to marginalized communities and definitely also women, there is a lack of participation and uh, a lack of access mainly to these complaint procedures. So take for example women working in rural areas, um, 
women living in poverty or lots of women working in the textile industry. So they don't have the means, they don't have the judicial support that alone the access to lawyers, and they don't even have the information on the existence of complaint procedures. And that is of course something very crucial because in, in because they, they, they will stay in this circle of abuse, even circle of violence, even you know in general the circle of un injustice. And uh, this is what we need to uh, find a breakthrough for. And this is why indeed also in the report on EMPL, uh, we say that the complaint procedures need to be very inclusive. Um, that means that, that companies are also responsible for making sure that the information on the existence of complaint procedures will really you know, get there. So not only through the informal networks or an informal network, network that you often have uh, to know the way, but that you also find other ways to make sure that this information uh, arrives uh, at, for example, uh, women and vulnerable groups. And uh, it's also part of that, that there is a good follow-up of complaints uh, so that it's being done in a timely uh, manner, uh, that also the complainants, uh, women in this case, um, know what to do and know what to expect. And if, for example, they... Uh, are in a way not capable of doing the complaint themselves. They also need to have access to representatives. This is also what we speak out about, uh, that, uh, that, that they have the right to have representatives in place that can help them, support them, or even do the, do the work for them. Um, the reason why it is so crucial that we have these inclusive complaint procedures is because of that, we will have more data also more gender disaggregated data. We know that based on data in a lot of sectors, we call it the high risk economic activities in our report, um, that a lot of these activities, women are targeted in a negative way. Women are a victim of abuse or even violence or you know a lack of good labor conditions. Um, so we have, made a selection of that list of the high-risk economic activities. But unfortunately, that is still not a complete list. So my point is that basically in every sector, there's basically not one sector in the world that you can find where women are safe or not a victim of, for example, uh, pay discrimination. So it, there, there's, there's always work to do when it comes to gender mainstreaming. So this is why I very much plead for every single company in every single sector, every single economic activity to always focus on women because there's 90, 90% chance. Um, so based on, on, uh, on the complaint procedures and the outcome of that, we will have more data and because of that data, we can only make the policy and targeted solutions for women better. But that starts with inclusive procedures. Thank you very much, Samira. And before I close with some concluding remarks, I would like to give the opportunity to Carolina or Susana to make a last point. Yep, that's right. Go ahead. Maybe, yeah. Carolina, you want to go well? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, so many important things have been discussed. It has been really a pleasure to be with the MPs today. Uh, uh, it's, it's fantastic to hear how there is a uh, political will to change things in the ground. Uh, it, in, on, on the technical side, uh, there's definitely a, an, an extraordinary opportunity to change things in the ground with the... <clears throat> With the directive on 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 uh, supply chains, uh, it, right now we're we're facing a world that it's absolutely interconnected. Uh, changes in the European regulation will have a huge huge impact in South America, and because they have already had that effect, uh, the European legislation, the OECD legislation regarding corruption, had a huge effect in the Chilean legislation, and new crimes were incorporated, and that meant. Uh, also prosecution of of corrupted politicians. So we we really are 
uh, eager to see the impacts of, of this uh, directive in Latin America and other parts of the world. It also uh, involves a, a new impulse on the conversation. Right now, South America is having this conversation of due diligence laws. Chile, Colombia, Mexico, even Argentina, Peru are already discussing this. And it's it's always important uh, on, on, on a more symbolic or philosophical uh, stand to, to understand that it, it looks like the world. I mean, let's hope that we are on the right path and the bad things that are happening are, well, part of the process of evolution, but it, it looks like we are, we're evolving to this uh, state where the planet understands that we are an interdependent, interconnected system, that in some level, we are definitely one system. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, companies have a duty to the communities where they operate. It's it's not uh, you know charity. It's it's the essence of being an interconnected being and, and not an isolated being. And uh, we're we're there, there's a very um, enriching uh, part of this whole process. I know that there are many obstacles still, many conversations that are going on uh, within the European Union and the European Parliament, uh, but we need to, to have this conversation because it will definitely take us to, to a better place. So thank you so much for the invitation. Bueno, muchas gracias por la oportunidad, pero es una oportunidad y es un poder para la exigibilidad de derechos en esta incidencia sobre la, vi, la debida diligencia, ya que en... Sorry. Uh, thanks a lot for this opportunity. The, I, uh, I believe that this is a key opportunity and that uh, we need to uh, work on this for... Uh... Ya que aquí en Europa, en Guatemala, se exporta el 68% de palma y un 20% de café, entre otros productos. Sin embargo, la vida de las mujeres pues está ahí trabajando porque somos más del 50% de mujeres y es ahí donde supuestamente un trabajo, pero no trabajo digno. Okay. Uh... One of the things because it's important is because uh, everything is connected. You import more than 60% of palm and 20% of uh, co coffee. And uh, it's women who is uh, who are working there. It's more than 50% of the working force is women. And it has a big impact in their life. Entonces, que haya ese control sobre esa importación para que pues se cumplen los derechos. Si no hay esa exigibilidad para nuestros derechos como mujeres, continuaremos en riesgo. It's necessary that there is a control over all this and that the, there is a control and the uh, responsibility over rights. And if not, the women will still be at risk. Ya que las certificaciones que hay para llegar productos, pues son de pantalla. Y muchas gracias. Certifications are greenwashing, but and thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Samira, Carolina, Susana, and Anusha for being here, and Daniel for the translation. It was very clear that in terms of access to justice, and thanks, Anusha, for reminding us of the EFRAC documents, uh, we, several of the stakeholders are on the same lines about the importance of complaint mechanisms that are gender sensitive and that uh, open the door for preventive measures, but also in terms of once there is harm done and then we need to access either uh, uh, authorities at national level or courts, uh, the reversal of burden of proof, statute of limitations and legal standing are key elements that still need to be included that were not part of the commission proposal and that are also not part of the council. So it's really uh, incumbent upon the parliament to make sure that those elements are included and are discussed in the trilogue negotiations. So thank you very much, everyone, uh, also for the extra time and apologies for the uh, lack of questions, but we do hope to have another opportunity to keep having these conversations together. Thank you, Karen. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>